Welcome to Enough Python to Fake It. I am really glad that all of you, I, I'm, I'm really proud of you for coming to a conference about a language that you don't know yet. That's actually how I got started in Python. I had I had read in a Python book some, and then it turns out there was a Python conference. I could tell that people were friendly. I was going to enjoy it, and indeed I did. And I just got further and further in. And as I went on learning over the next few months, I kept on having situations where, oh yeah, yeah, they did say something about that at the conference, and I didn't understand it at the time, but the fact that I was there actually does help me out now. So I'm hoping for an experience like that for you folks at PyOhio, and I'm hoping to supercharge it a little bit by giving you a little bit of an introduction up front. So you'll have spent a little time doing some Python yourself. We're actually going to have split into roughly two hours. The first hour is going to be the hands-on stuff. We'll try just a little bit of Python. Um, the second hour is going to, we're going to like keyboards down and we're going to be all about vocabulary. Trying to get a handle on all the words that you're going to hear flying around. Because Python, like pretty much every field, is full of jargon. And I'm not going to try to give like really good dictionary definitions. I bet if there are any experts watching this video later on, they're going to be like, she did not define that properly. Um, but that's okay. I want to give you enough of an idea so that later on when you hear these ideas at, in talks or in hallway conversations or whatever, you'll get some idea. Um, either that or we'll just all practice like looking intelligent and, and nodding as if we know. Don't worry that you have to scribble things down. We can get all this later on. It's on the handout. I am, this is me encouraging you to sit together because <laughs> programming is social. Alas, uh, there are no fingerprints. There are mark magic markers later on, but um, and you do have stickies, so a little bit of arts and crafts, I guess. Okay, our goal today is we don't have one. Isn't that nice? No pressure. Um, I have a bunch of exercises. I created more exercises than I believe we will finish. Um, maybe a lot more than we will finish, and that's okay. I want you to get an hour or so of hands on the keyboard doing Python. How far we get is not the question, because honestly, if you leave this tutorial and run out and put Python experience on your resume, you are a big fat liar. Uh, <laughs> this is a taste. To, we're, we're removing the fears so that you can start to experience the joy. And of course, as I mentioned, I hope you will get comfortable with the Pi oh, Ohio community, Python community in general. I hope you're all planning to stay for as much of the conference as you possibly can. All right, so I fished for a couple of reasons people were uh, considering Python before. Hang on, got a cough again. <laughs> all right, I'll tell you some reasons why you made an excellent choice this morning. Um, as programming languages go, Python is really nice in that it's a good beginner language because it is pretty easy to start with. Now, there will be points today when you say, this is not easy. And I'm like, well, yeah, okay, but for a programming language, it is easy. Honest, it gets worse than this. Um, but you don't have to graduate from it. There is no end to it. There are a lot of languages that are used to teach beginners that eventually you have to set aside because nobody does serious work in that. Um, people do serious work in Python. Uh, every time you are on the net, you are touching stuff that people have done in Python for sure. Uh, it's clean and readable, which I think is really important because you end up reading code a lot, not even other people's code, but your own code. Like, what was this crazy person doing? Oh yeah, I was the crazy person. What was I doing? That is an important part. And so the fact that Python is readable helps with that. <coughs> oh my goodness. Uh, there are libraries for pretty much everything. Okay. Okay. And library, this is our first uh, vocab term. That is a chunk of code that generally someone else wrote to handle some certain kind of problem. Uh, if you had to f solve all your programming problems by yourself from scratch, programming would be very, 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 very hard. Fortunately, when people have written libraries, that usually gets you seven-tenths, eight-tenths, nine-tenths of the way there to fixing a lot of your problems. And every language has its libraries, but Python just has a huge quantity. And in fact, 
the only difficulty is like if if your problem is well okay I want to scrape web pages that is I want to pull data off web pages oh gosh which of these dozens of libraries should I use for it that's where asking your friends in the Python community comes in handy um, and there is a thriving community there are local meetups there's tons of support online I find it a very friendly community and I hope you will too um, you won't find people saying well if you would read the documentation you will generally find people saying hey I would love to help you understand. And so try that out here at PyOhio today. When you're in these conversations and you don't understand where it's going, even though we did the little quick vocabulary intro, um, go ahead and ask people. And my prediction is that you will see their eyes will light up and it'll be, cool, I get to explain something that I enjoy. Um, the other interesting thing is sometimes they will say, okay, now that I'm trying to explain, I realize I don't understand it as well as I thought I did. That's always a fun experience. Uh, and then Python is very general purpose. It's been called the second best language at everything, which doesn't sound very flattering. But the point is, there may be a really specialized language that is great at certain tasks. Like um, statisticians have a language called R, and they generally love using R for statistics. Um, and that's great. Python is also really good at statistics, and R is useless at everything but statistics, whereas <laughs> Python covers the world. And, and beyond, there's all, every, every year at uh, Pi Ohio, there's at least one talk about what's going on with uh, NASA and Python or other space programs in Python. So yes, we have, now that is an interesting question. We weren't in time to get Python onto like any of the Voyager probes. So I wonder, I wonder how far Python is in the solar system right now. Um, except for programming a web browser. when code is running inside your web browser, that is not Python. And it's not fundamentally impossible to do it in Python. I won't get into the ways it can be done. It's generally not done. People fall back on JavaScript for that. Boo. Um, virtually everything else, Python is a great choice. And have you been to Python anywhere and set up a user account? Okay, great, because that's how we're going to be doing this. We are not going to try to install Python yet. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to go to a browser console. Let me so choose consoles and then choose start a new console. And I'll we're going to start a bash console. <laughs> and the reason for that is that we're going to pull all the code uh, on to, into your Python Anywhere account so that you can run it. Um, and so once you've got a little dollar sign like this, then unfortunately, I think you have to type the, the third line down in the handout that starts with git. And I, I think this is the longest bit of precise typing that you will have to do during the class. I certainly hope so. I think I'd better move on. So if you've, if you've done this, then you actually get out of here just by using the browser back button. I haven't figured out a better way to do it. Um, that gets you back to Python Anywhere. And then we go to Files. And then you should see a folder list with just enough Python over here in the directories. I'm going to choose that. And then you should see a long list of files in order. Now, there is a method to the madness here. Um, with each number, I, I've got usually f roughly four files in a group, each of which is supposed to illustrate one concept. Um, we have A, B, C, sometimes D, once in a while E. Um, I'm hoping that most of you can get through C. The idea is A already works exactly as it is. It's, it's there to give, give you something that you can look back at and say, wait, how did that go? And you can, a kind of classic, hello world. We choose run this file. All right. So this is the classic way that you introduce most programming languages. Um, 
there's almost nothing interesting here. Well, actually, there are a couple of interesting things. First of all, you'll see it's pretty straightforward. We have a print function, um, but then we have parentheses. And in Python, whenever we are passing information to a function, and I don't know how to define a function. A function is some code that does some things. Um, but usually, a function wants to receive some input. We use the parentheses to enclose it. Now, this we call this a string, uh, which is kind of an odd term for a chunk of text, but it's a string of characters, one after the other. Uh, we use quotation marks to enclose that string. That is how Python knows that Go team is just a chunk of text it wants to handle, that it doesn't need to go looking for a function called Go and a function called team. So at least once you will forget to use uh, quotation marks when you need to. At least once you will actually use quota accidentally use quotation marks where you shouldn't. It's OK. Uh, all is forgiven. So that is your, your very basic uh, example of a Python, oh, of a Python function. And the next thing that we're going to do as we go through these exercises, B is not quite complete, close, but you'll, there's something that you'll need to fill in. There will be some directions sometimes in a comment. Everything that's after the pound sign is a comment. So if we just run this as it is, it's not going to print anything. We want to print, uh, we want to print a nice cheer. So fill this in, run it, and see that you can run a little cheer. Um, when you've done that, move on to D, which is pretty similar, but there's even less provided. So you will have to get closer and closer to filling it all out yourself. Feel free to like open the A file in a different browser tab and go back and forth and look. I'm not expecting you to just look at it and instantly memorize the syntax. If you get as far as D before we move on, go ahead and try. The D stands for debug, meaning that it looks like it's done and I intentionally created an error. And if you want to try to figure out what's wrong with that, that is kind of like the for advanced students. However, um, I gave you all two stickies and I want to roughly keep track of our pace. The idea is every time we start an exercise, please put both stickies on your laptop facing me. Um, B for blue, C for crimson, which is pink. Um, and when you finish B, take the blue off and put it down. When you finish C, take the blue off and put it down. And when most of the stickers are off, that's about when I'll try moving to the next exercise. If you're not done and I move on, it's OK. Like I said, there's no specific goal. Um, I'm trying to keep us sort of synced up, but it doesn't have to be perfect. All right. Folks are noticing a little frustration that it keeps on keeping two consoles open, and it won't let you start more until you kill them off. Um, so probably the thing to do is keep this consoles page open in a separate tab so that at least you don't have to navigate in and out. Just you can. If we type exit. With parentheses, when you're done running, I, I should have run. Oh, no, I did run. W when you're done running the code here, uh, if, if we type exit with parentheses, that will kill this console. So we won't be, so you won't need to manually kill off all of our extra consoles. Um, is this whiteboard? No. <laughs> yeah. All right, I won't write that down. And. I'm hoping that most of the time that I'm not talking, you're talking, because that means you're helping each other or even showing each other things. So good job. Keep it up. Did anybody notice that, you, that the quotation marks that go around a string, it can be single or it can be double? But it's got to be consistent within a, a certain string. You can't start a string with a double quote and then end it with a single quote. OK, I think most of the stickers are done, so I'm going to move to 20 uh, variables. So a variable is basically a name we give to a chunk of data. And once we give it a name, 
then we can keep track of it and use it in multiple places later on. It would be a pain in the neck if every, you know, if every time I typed in my name, I had to type it in all over again. I can assign a name to it and then use that from then on. So in this case, what I'm doing, I'm saying, oh, I forgot to introduce my, the heroes of our story here. Let me get, let me, uh, yeah. Uh, so you, you see that we are doing a baseball theme. Uh, and so I was thinking, baseball, baseball. All right, how about the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League, famous from the movie, a team of their own, or a league of their own. And I checked, and there were no teams in Ohio. So that's frustrating. But the closest one I could find was um, Grand Rapids. And we always do have a lot of folks down here. Anybody from Michigan in the room? All right, OK. In your honor, uh, we ha I have named the exer I have filled the exercises with names of ball players from the Grand Rapids Chicks 1945 and 46 team because they had great names like Elma and and uh, and great nicknames too. So I didn't actually like their numbers and positions. And I'm I'm guessing about most of those, but but the names are real. So so in this case we have a. Have a player named Connie, uh, and we want to cheer for her. And so you'll notice that we do not now have to type Connie. We can just type batter, the word batter, because that is what we assigned. And um, you'll notice that batter does not have quote marks, but Connie does. Because batter is now just an internal name that we've given to this piece of data. You won't see you won't see batter appear on the screen. You'll see Connie appear on the screen. Let's go, Connie. All right. OK, so stickers on. And go ahead and take on B and C. And if you even finish up the D, feel free to just mess around. I mean, hopefully, as you're doing these, you're thinking of, oh, so what will happen if I this? What will happen if I that? Plus, of course, make sure that the person next to you is getting along and help them out if they're not. OK. Um, by the way, one of the vocab terms you'll hear is assignment. What we did here is we assigned the value, Connie, to the variable named batter. So that equals sign uh, is doing a, it is serving as an assignment operator. It's, so it's not really doing what you'd expect an equal sign to do in math. It's basically, it's saying, make this true, rather than claiming that it's true. It's forcing reality to comply. All right. So most folks are ready, I think, for, so stickers up. And let's take on lists now. So you generally use computers because you want to handle a lot of data. And storing one piece of data is nice, but storing a ton of data is ultimately more important. So Python has a couple of ways of doing this. And probably the most straightforward is called a list, which you can is characterized by these square brackets at the beginning of the end, and then commas in between the items in there. And what can go in a list? Anything can go in a list. We're keeping it simple with just some strings right now. But if we wanted, we could throw numbers in there. We can throw lists inside lists. We won't get to that today, but there's no reason you, can, you can't go uh, deeply nested. Once you have a list, then you, if you want to make use of a specific element within the list, square brackets come into play again, except that in this case, they're specifying which element. And for reasons that there are long discussions about, programmers start counting at zero. So um, in this case, wh which is our number zero batter? Exactly. So when we run this, uh, we should get Alma's name. So knowing that, you can go ahead and try running it if you like. If, if it's obvious to you what it's going to do, you can skip on to the B and take on the slightly unfinished ones. Lots of syntax errors. I'm, I assume everybody here has gotten at least one error message so far. Yes? OK. Yeah. Um, 
I, 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 did, I forgot to give you a pep talk talking about don't get discouraged by those. There's nothing wrong with error messages. They actually tell you good things. But yeah, um, and I don't think I forget this one anymore. But we will get to the point today where I will tell you don't forget to do this after 14 years of programming Python, I still forget to do it. So, you know, just, just accept, you know, we're humans, we make mistakes, it's okay. All right, as expected, it's impossible to really stay synced. So I'm just gonna move along every few minutes and, you know, don't worry if there's stuff that you come back to later. Uh, the next thing I'm gonna take a look at is loops. So, Lists wouldn't be that useful if you still had to grab each element individually. When you're handling a lot of data, you want to be able to do the same thing to each piece of data. Like in this case, we want to rattle off all of our batters. Um, so for that, we use we call them loops. This is a chunk of code that will do everything inside the loop more than once. In Python, the most common kind of loop it's called a for loop. So it starts with this magic word for. Uh, then there will be a variable name. And that variable name has not appeared before. It's kind of being assigned right here on the fly. Then there will be the magic word in. Then there will be, well, there could be, we could put a list here. In this case, I'm using batters, which is a list that we already defined right up there. Then there's a colon, and there has to be the colon. And then there's an indentation. And the indentation is something that scares some people from other languages, because it is mandatory. You need to go over, I'm going to say four spaces. Technically, it doesn't need to be four. Make it four. Um, hey, hey, get out, get out. Uh, OK. Um, and. The result of this is that everything that is inside the loop is going to run once for every element in my list, my list batteries. And every time it goes through, there's going to be kind of an invisible assignment statement. Imagine that in between those two lines, imagine it's saying at bat equals uh, batters zero, and then, then at bat equals batters one, and then at bat equals batters two. So that, when we get there, we're working on each element of this list in turn. <laughs> it is looping through the list, exactly. And that's when lists actually become useful. So stickers up. Try this out. OK, I'm going to move on to the next element, which is more about blocks, the, the O5 O's. So this piece of code, we want to, uh, we're going to strike out all the batters this time. And then we want to declare the inning over. We don't want to declare the inning over every single batter. We don't want to say, you're up, you're out, inning over. You're up, you're out, inning over. You're up, you're out, inning over. No, that's not how it works. Um, so where does this, there are some statements that belong within the loop, and then there's the statement that comes after the loop is all done. How do we know where the loop begins and ends? In most languages, they enclose it with like squiggly braces or something. Boo, hiss, that sucks. In Python, <laughs> <laughs> in wonderful, lovely Python, Python reads the code the same way your eyeball does. You probably assume that when the indentation stops, the block is over, so th the loop is over. And, and you're right, and Python reads this the same way. So how many times is this going to print the word out? Three, excellent. And, but it's only going to print innings over once. All right. Let's, uh, let's see if I, in fact, did that right. There we go. OK. So stickers up and experiment with the 050 stuff. Yeah. However, honestly, we're at about the halfway point. 
So I'm going to call for a break. Um, Ten minutes or so before we come back. And we're switching gears from the hands-on part to the vocabulary part and guidance on how to do more Python learning from here on. So uh, we won't necessarily be doing the exercises for the next part. Now, if you want to try tapping away while we're doing the discussion, that's fine. Um, other than that, you can take the exercises as uh, homework for future, uh, for progressing with your Python studies. Um, but yeah, it is, oh, it's 11.30 on the dot. So uh, I will release you. Uh, and at 11.40, we'll start talking about all the wonderful vocab words that you will hear swirling around. So 11.40. Um, the rest of our time, I'm going to split it up. We're, I'm going to save the last 10 or 15 minutes for advice about how to continue your Python studies from here. Until then, we're going to talk vocabulary. Mm, sorry. Jargon. Because you're going to hear so many words buzzing around you, it's fine not to know what they all are. But if you begin to get an idea of what some of them are, I think it'll help you get a little more into the talks, a little more into the conversations. And as, as I said before, um, when you're actually in a hallway conversation, feel free to interrupt and say, I don't know what that means. And you might start even more interesting conversations that way. In the meantime, there's way too many terms to actually go over them all, or even anywhere near all of them. So I thought we'd start out with a little voting exercise. So we get to stand up again. Um, oh, I'll see. And I put a lot of vocab terms on the table here. If you think you know them, you don't have to know it perfectly, but it's like, yeah, I, I think I got that, then please put a dot on that card. And if cards that accumulate a ton of dots, we won't bother. Or maybe we'll just brush over very quickly. Um, if you don't think you know it, you can just leave it blank. And if you're like, oh, yes, I've been dying to know what that word means. I keep on hearing it. It's driving me crazy. Then like, draw a little heart on it, and we'll know that that's, uh, that that's specifically targeted. So I got markers. So I told you there'd be a little arts and crafts part. That, that's our arts and crafts phase. So uh, let's, let's let the people decide. All right, so let's talk some jargon. Um, again, we'll, again, we will go for a brief and hopefully a little bit clear over technically accurate. So you know, if snotty people later on tell you want to tell you that your understanding is amateurish, fine, whatever. Um, you'll hear a lot about object orientation. Basically, an object is a piece of data which actually generally includes smaller pieces of data and some code that goes along with it. So we might create an object to describe a baseball player. And that might include their name and their jersey number. Um, and then we might say some uh, a function that goes along with it that is clipped directly to them. Uh, maybe we have, you know, swing the bat or something like that. Um, that would be an example of an object. And here is a class cat. We have one instance of the class cat, which has just instantiated several more instances of class cat, if that makes sense. A, a, class, a, a class describes objects, so not all objects are the same. We might have one object to describe baseball players and another object to describe cats. And then a specific object of that class is an instance. And when we make a new instance, we use the word instantiate so people will think we sound very smart. You will also hear of subclasses. A subclass is a class, so again, this is a, how we describe a certain group of objects, which, which, gosh, its definition comes from its parent class. Uh, so it has a lot of things in common with its parent class, but then it has some characteristics that are unique to it. So for example, if we have a class for baseball players, we might then create a subclass for pitchers because the pitcher has all the characteristics of a baseball player. They have a name, they have a jersey, but then they have um, maybe their own special kinds of data that only pitchers have, like number of strikeouts or something like that. So. Uh, when a function is clipped directly to an object, we call it a method. I'm not really sure why they're two separate names. A function is a, we didn't get to functions. Uh, a function is a freestanding piece of code that 
does, usually it does something with data and sends some data back. Uh, a method is the same thing, only it's attached directly to an object. So uh, a squeegee is a function. You can use it to squeegee your windshield. You can use it to squeegee someone else's windshield. You can use it to squeegee your dinner plate or your cat. It's maybe not such a good idea, but it's not attached to anything. You can try it with anything. You might get an exception, and in this case, the exception might be your arm gets clawed up, but it is, it is freestanding. Your windshield wiper is like that squeegee, only it is attached directly to your car, and it only works on your car. So that's your method. Uh, and it is, you do that because it is, it, it kind of provides more clarity. It's like, okay, now I know exactly what I'm supposed to do with this windshield wiper, and I won't accidentally use it on my cat. Um, usually these methods are instance methods, which means they work against a particular car, a particular cat. There is such a thing as a class method, which works against the class in general. Uh, I'm not gonna wait in there, because that gets complicated, but there's an introduction to the concept. Uh, so there are, basically today we just worked with the string data type. Obviously, Python also accommodates numbers. Everybody knows computers accommodate numbers. Um, there's also Booleans. A Boolean is true or false. That's the, those are the two kinds, and it is useful mostly when you're um, deciding which way the program should go. If, you know, if my team scored more than the other team, then my t team won and launched fireworks or something like that. Uh, tuple, we had at least one vote for this. A tuple is almost exactly like a list. Uh, you enclose it in round parens instead of square brackets. Uh, it can't be changed once you create it. Um, aside from that, you can just think of it as a kind of list. You may ask, well, then why does it exist? Um, and I'm going to set that conversation aside. But uh, yeah, do you pronounce it tuple or tuple? I don't know. I'm still trying to figure that out. There's, you will also see database people talking about tuples. And in that case, they mean rows in a table. And they want to sound smart. Um, Unicode, you may hear of, this is the version of text that accommodates all sorts of funky uh, beyond the letters on your keyboard. I gave an example of some of the funky European letters, but honestly, it extends into kanji, into Arabic writing, into emoji. Unicode covers the world. I think there's Unicode for Klingon letters. Uh, you know, they, once they figured out a way that they could represent all sorts of characters, they kind of went nuts. Iterators, this did get a couple of votes. So, if you can loop over something, it is iterable. So I suppose you could say that iterate is a fancy way of saying loop. So when we, we set up a, a list of the players, that was an iterable. And when we loop through it, we are iterating over it. Uh, and you can have an iterator which um, often iterators are just loops. They can also be data types like dictionaries, which we didn't get into, but they're in the exercises, and they're really cool. Um, you can write homemade iterators. Uh, in, this in that case, they can be a lot like functions, only, well, with a regular function, the function is asleep. You say, you call the function, that's the way you, w when you give a function's name and use parens to include the data you want to give it, or no data if you're calling it without any data. You're calling the function, say, hey, function, do your thing. The function wakes up, oh, okay, I got something to do, I take this data, I process it, I finish, I probably return some data, give it back to the program that gave it, uh, that, that kicked me off, probably it's an answer to a question, and then I go back to sleep, and I'm right back to where I were, and I don't know or care that I've been called before. An iterator, on the other hand, picks up where it left off, and the next time you call it, it will pick up from there. So like, okay, so let's say my, I'm an iterator and my purpose is to uh, count in French, so, oh, oh, <laughs> I get called again, oh, do it, okay, and I remember that I've already been called. All right, and it, most of the time, if there's a function 
in Python that you might expect to return a list, usually it will act as an iterator instead and only give you back one at a time. Uh, it, it will work lazily. If someone asks you for a dozen pancakes and you only have one modest sized pan, you could cook all dozen pancakes and then serve them all dozen pancakes, but you probably don't because they'll get cold and you don't know if they're really gonna eat a dozen pancakes. You bake one at a time, bake, fry, you cook one at a time and, um, and give them to them as they ask. We call that lazy evaluation and this also gets back to an iterator. Uh, lazy because we, we wait until we're asked for each one. That might be because we want to save memory, because if they're asking for 10 million pancakes, those could take a lot of memory. It might be because we want to get them started as soon as possible. If, you are, uh, if they are waiting for me to generate 10 million pancakes, they're starving to death. Um, and it might be because we don't believe they're really gonna use all that many, and so we give them one at a time. All right, um, and I don't think, I, th I think we do need to briefly mention, you will hear DSL, domain specific language. This is not a language like Python, which you can pretty much do all sorts of programming in. It's a little baby language that is for one very specific purpose. Um, somewhere I heard the example in a different talk that in Starbucks, you're ordering with a special domain specific language. You say, you know, venti, venti uh, I, don't, I don't drink coffee, so uh, you, you can fill in the blanks. Um, that is not a useful language for most purposes, but it is ideally suited to ordering coffee at Starbucks. Uh, so some examples in the Python world, you will hear about regexes, which is short for regular expressions. Any time that you use a star like to look for file names, like give me, you know, python.star for all the Python names, you are like touching barely the beginning of regexes in the sense that that wildcard lets you look for multiple things. Regex is a special language that lets you do incredibly detailed painfully detailed and specific searches to do things like, okay, give me all um, nine-digit zip codes, but not the, not the five-digit ones, just nine-digit ones with a dash in between. Uh, you may have heard of SQL or SQL. This is a domain-specific language for getting data, specific data, out of databases. Uh, and of course, HTML, the language that most, that all web pages are mostly written in, although then the JavaScript people get really wacky. Anyway, um, HTML is a domain-specific language for defining a uh, web page. Generally, domain-specific languages are declarative as opposed to imperative. Python is imperative. You, you tell Python how you want it to do what you want done. A declarative language, you don't say how you want it to happen. You, it, you don't delineate the steps. You just describe where you want to get to, the end result. In a, a SQL query, you say, I need all of the uh, players with a batting average above 250. You don't tell it, okay, look at each row, uh, look at this field, blah, blah, blah. That would be a step-by-step -step imperative set of directions. All right. Uh, I think we had, oh yeah, yeah, we definitely have, okay. So th there are some special Python specific tricks. One of them is introspection, which is kind of like it sounds. You take a piece of Python data, a an object, because actually in Python, every piece of data is an object. Even strings are objects, interestingly. And you have it sit back on the psychologist's couch and you say, tell me about your parents. Or in this case, well, yeah, you could say, tell me about your parents. Um, tell me about yourself, data. Well, like, w w what can you do, data? And the string will sit there saying, well, I, I can be uppercase, or I can be lowercase, um, I can be title case. Uh, these are all methods of a string. And when you introspect a Python object, you are asking basically what its methods are. That is, what, what are the functions that are attached to it that can run right against it? And what its attributes are, which are the uh, pieces of data. So if we defined a player object, and then we introspected that object. It might say, okay, my data is my name and my batting average and my um, jersey number. And I'm telling you all about what introspection means. I haven't shown you how. Um, 
the DIR command stands for directory, and it's showing you everything that is defined for this string. Uh, I stuck it into the variable x, and so then I can do things like say x. Oh, so x, you say you can do upper. The other kind of introspection that is really interesting is you can ask for help. So what's up with upper? And you get what is called the doc string, the documentation string. Every Python object can have a, a string of information attached to it that comes up when you ask for help. So you can avoid going to look up the documentation an awful lot by using introspection. It's pretty cool. All right. Um, I don't know if we've got into decorator. You, you'll hear decorator. A decorator is a little, it begins with an, when you take a function definition and you stick an, you put a line before it, which has, it begins with the at sign and then the name of your decorator. And the point is, it adds some functionality to the function without having to go into the function. So if I decide I want to record all the functions that are called um, in a log file, but I don't want to like go and rewrite every function in my program and add something in here to say, okay, I was called at this time with these arguments. Arguments, that's another vocab term. When you call a function, the data that you pass into that function are the arguments. So when we printed, we would normally say like print Alma. Well, Alma is an argument to the function. I don't know why we gave it a name that sounds like we're angry, we're not. I, I think it goes back to mathematics. Uh, all right, so that was yes. I was still on decorator. Okay, so we could write a logging decorator and then just stick that on the front of every function that we wanted to log, and it would change the functionality of that function without having to go inside and change the function. So if you see, if you ever see a car on the road and they've got a big fancy antenna and it's like magnetically clipped onto it, that's a decorator. They have decorated their car. It is added to the functionality without having to go inside and mess around with the car. Um, okay, I'm gonna say something about annotations. Um, you saw that when we, uh, oh no, no, we're not ready for annotations. You'll hear the word, but we're not ready for it. Okay, uh, REPL. It's an acronym, read, evaluate, print, loop. We didn't use it today, uh, but I used it just now. Usually when you write a pro Python program, it's a text file, and then you run the whole text file and everything happens. However, you can also do kind of a live improv theater form where you just type Python and a prompt appears, and then you can start doing a Python one command at a time. And that is called a REPL, because it reads what I typed, it evaluates it, it maybe prints a response, and it loops, because it comes back and says, all right, I did what you want, what next? So that is useful for trying out stuff. Um, an IDE stands for Integrated Development Environment. You, when you write code, you will, you can use a plain text editor, you should not ever use, like, Microsoft Word, no. Um, you could use Notepad in a pinch, um, but there are kinds of editors that specifically know stuff about programming. Uh, they're generally called integrated development environments. They help you out with things like some of them will, um, the same way that a word will make an ugly mark if you misspell a word, well these will make an ugly mark if, you're, if it can tell that you're writing some bad syntax. That helps. Some of them, will let you do code completion. Like if you start to type the name of a function and then hit tab, it'll say, oh yeah, I can tell you're, you're working on writing this function name, I'll fill it out for you. Some of them have debuggers built right into them where you can, um, when you run your program and something went wrong, it, is there a question? Um, I don't know. That's a good question. Did, I can't remember. Did it? Did it give you like little squiggly lines? And okay. All right. So that's an online IDE. Good example. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. True. Um, the one I'm going to recommend for beginners is called Mu. M U. Um, the folks who do the um, Raspberry Pi, I think, make it, or at least it's tied in with that. But it's really. It has most of the nice features, and it's just really straightforward, easy to figure out. Oh, uh, let me see. I think, I think I'm gonna skip Git, because I think a lot of people have heard of it. But um, 
when we do that open space session afterward, I'll, I'll go and put it on the board. If there are some of these that you like, oh, dang, I didn't know that. I wanted to know it. Um, go ahead and come on in there. I mentioned libraries. These are basically chunks of code that somebody else wrote, which you can import into your code and then use it, and you didn't have to write it. There's actually two steps. Installing it is downloading it onto your computer and getting it in a place where Python knows where it is. And then within any given script, you need to import it. So it's like you go to the store and you buy the blender. And now you own the blender. You installed it. Um, but it's in your cupboard. And now when you're cooking and you need to use it, you import it, meaning you get it out of the cupboard so that you can actually make some food with it. Um, my screen isn't showing the time anymore. How am I doing on time? 12.0. Uh, Great. Perfect. Uh, and so you'll hear about PIP. PIP is a program for installing. That is the program that you use to buy the library. Fortunately, you never have to actually buy it. It's always free. Yay. Software is wonderful. Um, and the, the giant big box mega store that you will generally, that PIP goes to is called PyPy. So eventually, you will probably write a library and say, you know what? I think other people could use this. And you're going to put it on PyPy, which stands for Python Package Index. But I still like the old name for it, which is the Cheese Shop, named for the My Monty Python skit. Oh, well. <coughs> OK. One more. Ooh, my. This. Oh, yeah. OK. Um. Hmm. I don't remember if I got virtual env out there. Yeah, a few people heard of it. OK. Well, Virtual environments, I'm going to say it anyway, because this is really useful. Um, imagine if you were a billionaire and you had one kitchen dedicated just to your Asian cooking with a giant wok and Ginsu knives and everything. That's cool. But it's like, no, oh, no, not Asian night. Tonight is tonight. I go to my Italian kitchen with big pasta pots and a brick pizza oven. Um, virtual environments kind of let you do that, where you get Python, to, you, you get libraries specific to the project you're working on, and they don't get in each other's way. When you work without virtual environments, it is possible to like, oh, I tried to, you know, I, I tried to use the wrong version of this pan. Okay, this, this analogy is getting strained. But if you don't use virtual environments, you can only use one version of each library at a time, and it's possible to have clashing versions. So virtual environments, yeah, they're, they're like separate kitchens for each of your projects. And when you're finished with the project, you can just like burn it down. <laughs> uh, Docker is kind of like the next level of virtual environment. It is a sort of, oh, the Docker people would hate it if I said this, but it's a sort of virtual machine. Yeah, that is, that is built just, usually it's just for one purpose, like uh, you might, want to run a database, but you don't want to figure out installing it and configuring it on your machine. And maybe it's not even available for your kind of machine. You can get a you can download a Docker container which kind of like runs in its own little world and communicates with you and you hopefully don't have to worry about what goes on in there. So if virtual environment is like a kitchen that is dedicated to your project, Docker is like somebody pulls up a trailer and the kitchen is there inside the trailer and it has a it has solar generators, and it has its own water hookup, and you should not need to think about anything, Docker. ideally. Uh, ooh, OK. So Docker runs code, and IDE is for writing code. Um, you won't ever, um, oh, gosh, no, I shouldn't say ever. Um, usually, when you're using Docker, it is because you need to use some kind of specialty software, and you really don't want to deal with any of its details. You want it to come ready to go doing its own thing, um, like databases. Um, it's not actually a Python term, um, but Python people end up using them a lot. So, All right. Um, testing. Imagine if every single time you sat down to work in the morning, you had to pass your final exam from college. Sounds like hell, but we can put computers through hell, and that's cool. Um, the reason we do that is to avoid regression. Have you ever fixed one thing and broken a different thing while you were at it? When you write tests, and, and tests are basically code to test other code, 
then you can run that test every time you make a change, and that will alert you to the fact that you broke that while you broke while you fixed that. That your functionality has regressed, which is why they call it regression testing. Uh, you all your tests together for a project are called the test suite. Um, I am running short, so I'm going to skip to some of the. Uh, I'm only going to hit some uh, really important ones here. Um, yeah, I think we basically web programming. You'll hear about back end, front end, server side, client side. Basically, everything that happens inside your browser, your Firefox or your Chromium, that's front end or browser. It unfortunately is generally not in Python. It's very hard to make it in Python. The back end is the server somewhere that your browser went and asked for information. And there, everything can be Python. Hopefully, it is Python. And it will be. There will be a Python program running there whose job is to get these web requests and answer them. And that probably is not written from scratch. It probably uses a package like Django. So you will hear a ton about Django. That's just a, a library that lets you put up dynamic websites, meaning they're different for everybody who comes to it. If you ever write a website that is the same for everybody who comes to it, you should not be bothering with Python. You don't need it. Just write it in HTML. But when it keeps changing, because it's today's weather, or it's something customized for you, uh, Python, and specifically Django, is a great way to do that. Flask is an alternative. There are approximately 7,000 different Python libraries you can use to write web applications. Django is the most popular, and kind of one that I like it best because I'm not a great web programmer and it kind of holds my hand. Flask is much more like, mm, you figure this out, kiddo. You know, you think you're so smart. Go ahead and knock yourself out. So people who really do know their web up and down sometimes like it better. Um, and then there's a zillion more, but those are the main ones you'll hear about. All right, let me see. I'm going to make sure that I got all of these guys. Oh, I got most of them. Um, OK, you will hear uh, continuous integration. So I mentioned testing and the fact that you should run your tests every time you make a change to the code. Continuous integration does is when you put everything that you want to happen every time you make a change you you have a structure which does that all automatically each time and this may include running the tests to make sure you didn't just break it um, it may include checking the format of the code and, and scolding you if you, know, you can write Python code that works but is not considered uh, as clean as elegant as, as just well structured there are programs to scold you about that and it's actually a good uh, idea to use them. Uh, even a program called Black, which is automatically, hey, I'm, I'm rewriting your code in a very standard way. Um, that can be done by continuous integration. Um, you can have continuous integration do things like uh, generate documentation, um, usually not totally from scratch, but it'll take some plain text documentation and make a fancy web page. You can have it go as far as take your code, if this is code that is meant to run on a server, like it's running a, a website, and every time like I, I save the changes I made, and I commit those changes to version co control, I do my git commit, and I push that up, and then continuous integration says, okay, I ran your tests, your test passed, good for you. I, I reformatted it. I generated documentation, and because it's all good, I am putting it on the web server, and now Everybody out there who comes to your site will see the new version uh, without a human being even ever having to make that final step. So people who are really confident in their continuous integration go that far. Uh, and then the term Pythonic came up. Uh, when we talk about Pythonic, we mean more than just Python code that will run successfully, but Python code which is written in ways that take advantage of Python's own special powers. Um, to be more, maybe more efficient, or more elegant, or more concise than we could if we were writing in other programming languages. Um, most things that, maybe everything that Python can do can be done in other ways, and sometimes if you've got experience in another programming language, you'll go ahead and write Python in the same way that you would write your other programming language. There, you know, people will tease you, hey, you're writing Java in Python, meaning you're thinking in Java and you're structuring it like you would in Java. 
but you're not taking advantage of the cool things that Python has, um, like list comprehensions, which I didn't even put on a card. Uh, I would have to demonstrate it. Um, so so w as, you, as your Python gets better and better, you learn Python's special powers. You incorporate them into your code, and then you are Pythonic. You know, but if you're not Pythonic, look, it works. That's what matters most. Don't, don't let people get on your case about it. Oh, I think, as you can see, I, I prepared for a lot more terms than I knew we would ever be. Oh, oh, JSON was on there. Okay, I got to mention this. So objects in memory are um, when you need to take data that's in memory that you're working with in Python and then either put it on disk or maybe send it over the network somewhere else, uh, it can't be this living in memory version, it's got to be, quote, serialized into basically a string of bytes, um, B-Y-T-E-S, uh, which is a lot like a string of text. So it's kind of like if we're playing chess and we have the pieces in a given place, and it's like, oh, we got to go. If you've seen chess notation, they, chess players have a way to write down, they actually can write down the the movements, but let's just say they have a way to write down the position of every chess piece. We can serialize that chessboard into a record of where all the pieces are, and then put the chessboard away and leave, and come back later and set the chessboard up again and read our list of positions, and then we are deserializing, and we are getting it back into memory, and we're, we're basically like rehydrating this dehydrated information that was, maybe it was written to disk or on a piece of paper or sent over the network. So that's serializing. JSON, JavaScript object notation, um, is, a, is a format for serializing. So if I'm working with Python data and then I need to plunk it down into a, a file, um, I can use JSON to write it out into that file and then close it down and a different Python program can open it up and read it. Uh, in the case of JSON, it doesn't have to be, be a Python program. It can be a Ruby program, or a JavaScript program, or a C program. Pretty much every language knows how to read JSON. So you can, all, you can use it to store data. You can also use it to send data around, including to completely different programs written by different people in different languages. Okay, I think I better cut it out with the uh, vocabulary and skip to how to learn Python. So. Uh, it's fun to write Python tutorials, so too many people have. Uh, there are a huge variety, and I don't know how to tell you which ones are the best ones. Uh, a lot of them work well. However, on the python.org website, kind of hidden away, let's see if we can find it. Um, it's not really hidden, but maybe it should be more obvious. There is a beginner's guide. There we go. You should go there. Um, it includes things like uh, lists of, here's one for non-programmers, lots of tutorials. Um, and there's another one for programmers from other languages who don't know Python. So basically, make sure you hit the beginner's guide for sure. Um, oh, I don't like the way that lost my place. Okay, I will call out one of them called pythontutor.com because it's another uh, online website where you can uh, uh, where you can edit Python and run it online. But it also diagrams out the program logic automatically for you, which can be helpful when you're trying to figure out wait what what where did that what's that variable doing where did it go uh, wh what's up with this list. Um, there's a great book called Automate the Boring Stuff with Python, and it's also available online for free. It is kind of based around helping you learn to do the sort of business tasks automatically, like, oh, somebody gave me a spreadsheet, and I'm supposed to insert s things from it into a Word document, but only under these conditions. Well, it helps you write Python programs to do that. Um, if you like hardware, there's a lot of cool hardware, uh, like the Circuit Python Express is specifically designed to be easily programmable in Python and to easily use cool hardware connections. So you can do things like, uh, you know, every time I shake it, I want to, you know, play the Star Spangled Banner or something like that, because that means I, the, the, the game is starting and we need to play the anthem. Um, 
One interesting tutorial approach is called the Python koans. Um, I don't know, it, it's, it's a way of, it's a little like the ones I was doing today, but it kind of maybe takes you a little more by the hand. Um, giving you always code with one empty space at a time, moving you ahead that way. So that's one to look at, but there are hundreds of tutorials. Poke around, try whatever works well. Uh, lots of Learn Python online sites. Um, I, they're all about the same, as far as I'm concerned. Um, get to know how to use a debugger. Uh, there's a built-in one in Python called PDB. Go ahead and look it up. There are talks about it, introductions for it. A debugger lets you stop the execution of code at a specific time and look at like what the variable values are at that point. Because um, it can be really hard when you just like let it run through. It's like, wait, that's not what I expected. Uh, but when you can go through one step at a time, that can really help you figure out the bugs. Because there will be bugs. There will always be bugs. Um, I keep on forgetting to do this. Um, there's a site called PyVideo. There are tons of conference talks online. They're, online, they're great. You can go to YouTube directly. PyVideo curates them from Python conferences, and it includes the abstract when available. So that, that can save you time in figuring out which ones you really want to watch. Um, learn to look for libraries slash modules. When I mentioned downloading stuff from PyPy with pip, um, Almost always, whatever you are, want to work on, there's a library out there that somebody has done. Um, and if you are having trouble finding one or finding a good one, that's one of the things the Python community is great about. Ask someone in person at a meetup or something like that, or online, uh, hey, I, I want to scrape websites. What should I be looking at? And they'll tell you, oh yeah, try Scrapey, for example. Um, as you're graduating to trying to write not just like something that, dear God, please works, into like, okay, I, I want to like, you know, maybe kind of write Python I'm proud of. Actually, be proud of all of it. Um, there's a great blog called Module of the Week, which describes modules from the Python standard library. Um, these are the libraries that you don't have to install because they're automatically provided with Python. You do need to import it, and you need to understand it. And this blog does a great job of describing them. Uh, there is a website called the Hitchhiker's Guide, which explains how to approach various kinds of um, various kinds of problems and what you should be uh, what you should be looking at using it also points you to the popular libraries for some of these problems um, and then my favorite intermediate level book is the O'Reilly Python cookbook just because it includes uh, good descriptions of how to do uh, tasks pythonically Community, community, I keep on saying it. Get really involved. Ask people for help. Ask them for advice. They love to give it. Um, tr we didn't get into Jupyter. Try out Jupyter with a Y. This is an interactive environment. Um, it runs in a web browser, but you can run cells of Python in the web browser, and you can mix up cells of Python with cells of documentation. So people have produced really wonderful textbooks where there are cells in the middle with Python, and you can as you you know you're, you're reading the description and then you get to a cell and you can execute the cell and like, oh that's interesting and then you can mess with the python and execute it again and see how it changed it's really awesome and jupiter is one of the things when we do the open space if you haven't seen jupiter drop by and i'll show you jupiter uh okay also if you want to get you know, we'll get you python installed we'll get mu that editor installed we won <laughs> You're Python people, congratulations. Um, we're very close to time. Uh, I'm, I'm a good person and I, these are all uh, Creative Commons uh, images. Uh, I've got, thank you so much, you're awesome. I would also love, oh, okay. Um,